Hey, Chandler Wolt here, and joining me today uh, is Justin and Alexis Black. Uh, uh, Justin and Alexis are SBS students uh, and author of the book, Redefining Normal. Um, this book just launched a few months ago, so actually five months ago, has already sold over 5,200 copies. Um, so, I'm gonna, so first ever two-person interview on the podcast, so this will be fun. This will be a, a fun experience. So I'll tell you about Justin, I'll tell you about Alexis. So um, beyond obviously writing the book, having a ton of success with the book, and uh, it's been really fun kind of following their story. So Justin created uh, the Rising Over Societal Expectations or ROSE uh, Empowerment Group with a vision to close the information gap for today's generation of black and brown young adults um, after his experiences uh, as a black male in the foster care system. Uh, Alexis is also a proud foster care alumni uh, and she founded the Scholarship Expert and where she authored a book called The Scholarship Blueprint. Uh, and a workbook there with an online course and all that good stuff to help students um, graduate from college debt free. So um, just an amazing story I was telling them beforehand. Uh, it's been fun being a part of their journey at Self-Publishing School and they've got a lot of fans on the Self-Publishing School team and we just love supporting them, love rooting for them. So today we're gonna be talking about how to write a memoir that actually sells copies without being famous. <laughs> uh, and, and so this should, for anyone thinking about writing a memoir, this is a must listen, you'll enjoy this. So Justin and Alexis, great to have you here. Thank you so much for having us. It's definitely an honor to be on here. We've been rooting for this for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely a blessing to be able to talk to you today. And uh, we're just uh, super excited to talk about our experiences. Yeah, uh, so let's start, like why write this book? Why, was, why is this something that's, that, that was important um, for both of you? Yeah, we actually kind of came to this idea because several people have told us throughout the years that we should write a book just because, you know, our experiences that we've gone through and where we are today, and especially now, um, both being college graduates, as both of us being foster youth, um, we're less than 3% graduate college. So there was that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, um, we're, we got married, yeah. uh, we own several companies and all these things, just kind of telling people about our journey. And um, actually from reading, reading your book called Publish, that's what really gave us that kind of head start on where we should start, what are the first steps and what we should do. And uh, Justin asked me, you know, what is something that you talk about every day that you could write a book about? And I said, relationships. We talk about relationships almost every day, just because we have never really been surrounded by healthy relationships outside of my mm. foster and adoptive parents. Um, and then Justin, pretty much when he got to college. And so that's many years of very unhealthy habits that we've learned and mm. kind of integrated those into our relationships. And so for us, as trying to get um, get ready to get married and all these things, we're like, we should probably be as proactive as possible in this process of our relationship and moving forward. Um, and we're huge on, uh, on our faith and wanting to support other people. And we just, because we've been through a lot, we really feel it's a duty of ours to give back to others. And so all these things kind of bunched together, we decided to write a book, but not just a book about our lives, but also about uh, what can other people learn from our journey and apply it to theirs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so why we talked about this, or we you know, briefly touched on this <laughs> right before the interview. Why a memoir? I mean, it, it, it's it, the, the, you guys are on the inspirational storyline, right? Where it can skew. Okay, is this is this more of a nonfiction book with stories sprinkled in? Is this a memoir that we might sprinkle in some lessons? Like, it, it, I feel like th those are almost. It, it's a thin line, but they're kind of two different books and and two different styles of books. So, what for you guys said? Okay, we want to write a book, but then it's and we're also going to make it a memoir. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things that really made us want to focus on this being a memoir was the fact that if you really look at our life story, I think there's so much that we want to just teach and learn, help people learn and understand of trying to help people get familiar with the, the culture that comes from living in poverty and generational cycles of that, generational uh, habits of unresolved mental health issues and so many other things, and using ourselves as an example of doing that and really focusing in on just what can people get from our story. And just, I always view our situations as so unique because, you know, we look back on our trauma and the, the, the idea of redefining normal is that, you know, in our childhood, there were so many things in our lives that was normal. You know, it was so many things that if I told you about, in my mind, I'm like, 
it wasn't that big a deal. But if I told you about it, it probably blow your mind. And as even right. when we were working with our editor, we were like, should we put this in the book? We're not sure. I don't think it's that big a deal. And she's like, wow, that I can't believe that happened to you. You need to talk a bit about that and describe it because there's so many people that can learn from that circumstance. So when it comes to the memoir aspect, I feel that so many people could really learn from our experiences and our, our circumstances and our story. And we just feel that sharing our story is it, so many people, even though it's unique, who've gone through some similar things in similar circumstances. Yeah, and, and I love that. What What is it kind of like a lesson within a lesson, I guess? What would be, and I'd love to hear from both of you guys on this, what would be your tips for either other folks who came from a tough background or from the foster adopt system? What do you, what do you think about that was a blessing and helped you through the process of writing and publishing a book? Like, mm -hmm. and, and that, that you would encourage other folks kind of from that background um, to write and publish a book. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody honestly has a strong story. It's how you phrase it and how you kind of package it into a book. And from many blogs and things that I've read, and even from different um, podcasts that I've listened to and group sessions within SBS, I learned that when you write a memoir, you have to be very careful and not be the victim in it, but be the victor through it. And how can other people learn from you and gain, uh, you know, some knowledge from you. And there is that fine line between the nonfiction and the memoir, where with us, we believe that if you were really to, if we need you to understand exactly what lesson we're trying to teach, you have to understand understand our background in that process through it. And that's the same with anybody who's thinking about writing a memoir. You have to think about how can you bring other people in? Because even though this book is about you, it isn't at the end of the day. It is how mm. they are going to take something from it and take it forward and incorporate it into their life. And so you have to think big picture rather than just about yourself. And the biggest thing uh, that could probably say is to get a really good editor because your story, it is important. Nobody's saying that it's not, but not everything needs to be in there. And I think that was really, really difficult for me is uh, stepping back and being um, really just giving the reins over to our editor and to Justin and saying, I trust you in this process uh, and I have to let go of some pieces. And so um, so with that, you know, making sure that it's buttoned up tight and really good, well written uh, so that people can follow along and incorporate it to their own life. Mm -hmm. I think also what, what this experience really requires is to be self-reflective, authentic, and intentional. So the authenticity piece really requires individuals and writers to be uh, uh, self-reflective of their experiences. A lot of people say this book is very conversational and that's why we we're very excited for our audio book when that comes out because when you listen to our story and it's just like we're just having a conversation with you and the authenticity, you know, there are things that may rub people the wrong way with our experience, with our story. We're taking direct quotes from things that we've said and things that have been said to us, no matter how foul the language is. We want you to feel that experience and understand how, understand the impact it had on our lives. So with that being said, it really takes a lot of authenticity for people to understand and feel your story and be in your shoes. We always, our goal was really to take you into the rooms where things happen in our lives, where some of the, the worst things in our lives have happening and break that down detail by detail so you can feel what we felt, you can hear what we heard. And I think if anyone is getting ready to write a memoir and take readers through that experience, try to be as detailed as possible about your feelings or emotions, what you've gone through. And don't just, it, it takes maybe having other people maybe question and ask you those questions and really have those conversations, even if you need to record yourself talking and having those conversations, because a lot of yeah. people communicate better through conversations and talking and then recording those conversations and then writing it down. That's something yeah. that me and Alexis did. A lot of times she she writes very, uh, <laughs> she doesn't write in much, de much detail sometimes and understandably mm. so because some of her experiences can be extremely traumatic. So- right. What, what we did to try to get as much into the book was to try to record those conversations and write the small details of what she remembered in order to help readers get the most out of the book and what they read. Yeah. Gosh, so many, so many follow-up questions I have on that and a couple of thoughts I'll share and then I'll ask some follow-up questions. I, I love that piece you just touched on, Justin, which is... It, it, um, it, I, I, I'm similar, Alexis. It was just like, okay, let me directly communicate what happened. But it's when you're when you're writing memoir, it, it actually more closely resembles a fiction book in the yes. storytelling aspect, right? Mm -hmm. like we have the fundamentals of fiction and story program. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are surprised when it's like, hold up, 
I'm writing a memoir. You're going to put me in the fiction program. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, well, yes. If depending on which way you go, because you're writing a story and that involves, like you said, Justin, dropping people into the room mm-hmm. and feeling the, the, and feeling those feelings. And, and, and so I've got a follow-up question on this, but I want to also just uh, touch on one more thing that I think is important. It's a guy who taught me entrepreneurship in high school, no, not high school. I guess this was more college. Um, and he said, and, it, and, and so this is like kind of, I love what you, what you were touching on a second ago, Alexis, the, the victor, not victim. And, and he, he, he was very passionate about teaching uh, entrepreneurship to underprivileged kids. And he's like, they actually are the best suited to being entrepreneurs. It's like, imagine if you had to daily survive and mm-hmm. all of the life skills that you learn, you're, you're problem solving, you're, you're doing all these things that actually really closely resembles what it looks like to be an entrepreneur. And so, Absolutely. you know, in this case, it's, it's not necessarily entrepreneurship, it's, it's uh, writing a book and publishing a book, which is in a lot of ways, when you're self-publishing, you're being your own boss and, mm-hmm. and, and that does resemble entrepreneurship. So I love that the victor, not victim and, 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 and recognizing, Hey, there are some really powerful uh, skill sets that I learned from my background that I can parlay into uh, this, mm-hmm. this process. And so uh, you touched on one thing I want to, I want to um, ask some follow-ups on though, is about t- trauma and working through past trauma and experiences. And I think with a lot of people, when they're writing a memoir, that can be the hardest part. And it can almost deadlock your writing because mm-hmm. you don't want to write because that will force you to dig up things yeah. um, that, that were, that are painful. And it's, you know, I could call it free therapy, right? It's like you're, it's a therapeutic process, but it's, it can be difficult. So I'd love to hear your guys' perspective on that of how did you work through that? Any tips for other people who are writing books about um, really difficult experiences? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of counseling. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> counseling. So we, we both have individual counseling, which I absolutely recommend. You have to have a support system in place before you go on this journey of writing your memoir or unleashing all these things that maybe you don't even realize are there. And I know for myself, uh, I had the, I have like this little box where I seal things in kind of this imaginary box in the back of my mind. And as we were writing this book at like two, 3 AM, I'm waking up sweating, crying, uh, just upset. And I'm like, I need to talk to my counselor tomorrow <laughs> because there's so many things that are kind of unleashed in this process that you may not even realize. And so you have to be in a, in a healthy, safe place in order to go through this, but also having that, um, having that support system around you, who's willing to be there and you can lean on them in this process. So you have to make sure that you're in that mindset. Uh, and so having Justin there with me and the fact that we have a lot of similar experiences actually really helped. And as, as he mentioned that I really struggled with not just doing what he kept calling as the police report method, where it was like this and this and this happened, where I didn't have any emotions or anything else there. And so I can say 100%, this book would not have been written without him because I essentially spoke my parts out loud for him and he wrote it down, pretty much translating my thoughts into those feelings and writing it down um, into words. And so that's how we sort of did the process together. So make sure that you have a support system, possibly counseling, and you're in a healthy, safe place. Those are my biggest, uh, my biggest suggestions. What about you? I would say for me, it really helped that I had my partner here. You know, it, it, we're, we're very privileged to be able to write like one of our first books with one another. And the book is structured where, you know, we tell her, I, she tells her perspective on a certain subject. I tell my perspective on a certain subject as it relates to our life story. And we always say people can take our lives out of the book and put their life in. We, everybody has to shape their definition of love. Everybody has to, has a time where they, maybe they've been desperate for love and has gone through the struggles of mental health and so many other things. And for me, I feel that this book has really helped me or, or the process of this book, uh, going along the journey of writing it is the, one of the biggest things that has really helped me is just Alexis' willingness to be vulnerable and to be open. And the things that she shared in this book about her past and her experiences and now I'm so reflective of, you know, if she's gone through what she's gone through and she's willing to share this and be open and honest, then who am I to leave things out of the book? Who am I to try to position myself as a hero of even this, this idea of look at me, look at all the things I've overcome and I'm victorious. And at moments of the book, I share bad details where it's not just me being the victim, where I'm the abuser, I'm doing things wrong in my life and I want you to see my mistakes. 
where I've heard people say on different presentations and, and, and different events where people tell me like, there are moments in the book where I don't like you. <laughs> and I'm completely fine with that because there are moments and times in my yeah. life where I didn't like myself and I'm cool with that. And as long as they fully understand the, understand the concept of what I'm trying to say and the point I'm trying to get across, then I'm cool with them not liking me at certain points of the book. As long as they understand the entire thing and get the full experience of what we're talking about. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and it's important to share the raw details, the tough details, and not just, I mean, we've all, we've all read those, you know, biographies or where it's like, okay, this feels like a very much whitewashed version of this person's life. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it how much was this ghostwriter paid to write this book that yeah. only highlighted the amazing things and and you it makes you trust the story less so i think it not only mm -hmm. makes for a more compelling story um, but it is more impactful and, and believable you guys touched on co-authoring i'd love to, to 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 talk about this i think co-authoring is one of the hardest things you can do as an author it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, I always say it's kind of like trying to paint a painting and you have two hands on the paintbrush. It's very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I, I brought on a uh, Leif Babin. It's a good episode, um, it, for folks to listen to, um, the co-author of extreme ownership, which is funny right before this interview, um, uh, we just, we are doing our company book club on extreme ownership right now. It's one of my favorite leadership books of all time, but um, Leif, I would talk to him about how they did the co-author process, which I would have thought was smart. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, how did you successfully co-author the book and any, any hard, uh, hard uh, lessons learned or tips that you'd give for other people who are co-authoring a book? Yeah, I'd say number one tip, get the book published because that 100% set our foundation for us. And when I say that, it's because we couldn't have written this, have done this entire process without having that foundation set and trying to understand how are we gonna organize this book? I think this would have been one massive, huge argument, honestly, between the two of us, if we didn't have a clear vision that we agreed mm. upon of what is every chapter gonna be, what is it gonna be about, but then trusting the other person to write their part. I mean, I probably fell short on mine because I didn't add all those details in, but I, I gave enough to where we could work with it. And so for the both of us, even though, was really, really actually interesting is that uh, what we did was we wrote our outline for the book and we did that actually in a couple of days. So we um, uh, like outline of this is what the chapters are gonna be. And then we just sat down and started writing and we didn't check in with each other to see what we were writing about. But after we printed off our first draft, so we started in Mar on March 26, basically. And then we finished our first draft in June. We printed it off and we read it throughout loud as you suggested. And we actually read each other's parts out loud. So I read his part mm, out loud and nice. he read mine. And so that was a way for us to kind of Smart. put each other in our in the other's shoes and bring mm. more compassion and love, which is what we wanted out of this project. Mm. And, but it also brought a lot of things to light of how each of our transition actually went right into the other without even mm. doing it on purpose, where he sort of filled in gaps that I didn't and I filled in gaps that he didn't. Mm. And we didn't even plan that out. That's how I knew that this was really, for us, we felt like it was a God moment and how mm. we really felt led led by that. Um, but then once we did that first draft, we saw together different loopholes and different things yeah. that needed to be done and done better. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing when you have a, a partnership working together is bringing in that third party, that editor who can come <laughs> in and say, you know, objectively, yeah. this yeah. is the actual gaps from the reader, <laughs> not from your life or your yeah. perspective. Yeah but for me, sure. and this is what you need to do better and working through that. And so I think that hundred percent helped our, bring our books to life was having a really good editor that trusted yes. us, that had those phone calls um, and that we could lean on uh, mm -hmm. because if not, I mean, I think we would have been led by our own paths. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys rotate chapters? Was it one person writes a chapter than the next? Was it layered chapters? Like how did you structure the actual who wrote what? Yeah, so it's basically laid out pretty simple where, I mean, there may be uh, the first chapter in the book is called Words on the Index Card. And Alexis tells her perspective. And it's uniquely laid out because before each chapter, there are statistics and the subtitle is How Two Foster Kids Beat the Odds. So before she goes, there are statistics on maybe foster youth in general, uh, women who've gone through the foster care system or something that may relate to her or both of us. So there are statistics that laid out and then it says her name. So you're under, you're understanding the perspective of Alexis based on this chapter and this moment in her life. And then after you go through her part, you get to my part where 
there may be statistics that relate to me as a black man or things that I've experienced or maybe even both of us. And so it says my name and then you kind of get into things on my perspective of maybe my definition of love and my transition into the foster care system or other things that we discuss within the book. Mm -hmm. And we did that on purpose because we wanted people to really visually see that we had to go yeah. through individual journeys of healing mm -hmm. and self-discovery before we could come together and have a healthy relationship. Um, cause myself, I was, and myself and several other people that I know, uh, have gone into those unhealthy relationships, hoping that they would heal them, save them, whatever it is. And so we really had to show mm -hmm. that we went through those two journeys. And so mm -hmm. every chapter, as he mentioned, is broken down between the two of us. So you can see both perspectives. Yeah, that's great. I mean, there's so much to unpack here. I want to, one more quick writing question. I want to go into marketing because I know you guys have done a lot of things well there. And I, I imagine a lot of people listening or watching will have marketing, memoir marketing questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so kind of final, final question on the, the writing piece. Um, any, any final tips for writing a good memoir? And then maybe even a more specific question would be how do you, how did you choose between balancing between sharing your story and practical tips? And how did you kind of land on a mix that made sense? I think people have to, when you're writing a memoir, you want to try to teach readers a lesson within your book. And I think her mom uh, actually helped with that. Her adoptive mom really helped with that. So as she read the book and, you know, we didn't want to give it to too many people to kind of alter our perspective and our goal with the book, but we wanted to give it to a few trusted people that we knew would give us honest and good feedback. And her, her adoptive mom was one of the main people that we really both wanted to read the book. And as she read it, she said that, oh, this is a piece missing right here. Or as you go through the book, you kind of take us through, you know, when we first met and two people coming from a certain lifestyle, certain world, and we meet on this college campus. And then we kind of go back to, into our personal narratives of our, our, how our identity was shaped and our transition into the system. But something that her mom was able to identify was as we made that progression into the trauma, internalizing it and expressing it. And then we made the transition into taking off all these years and weight of, of burden and, and things that we've gone through. She may identify, well, the story was kind of going up and motivating at this point. And then you kind of had this big uncomfortable drop for whatever reason at the end of this chapter. And you need to do something to kind of bring it all together and put the puzzle pieces back together. So really you wanna help people understand the lessons and value within your story where you're not becoming a complete instructor where there are parts of the book where we are more teaching and instructing, but it's really more of you're understanding the lessons and different things within our experiences and in our story. And there may be a paragraph at the beginning that kind of introduces you to this, what you're getting ready to to learn from our story and maybe an outro of the of that chapter of kind of summarizing uh, kind of what readers should kind of think about and uh, take nice. away from yeah yeah that's great hey let's transition to marketing all right uh, you you sold you know i think over 5200 books copies mm -hmm. in 5 months which is just awesome uh, and and especially i mean like you said I can't remember if this is before the interview or during the interview, but, but people said, don't write a memoir, oh, <laughs> just yeah. get a nonfiction book. So, I, I mean, especially um, for selling copies of a memoir, I mean, it's, it's just awesome. So uh, opening question on the marketing side of things, how have you sold so many copies uh, and, and what are like the two or three things that have, have moved the most books? Yeah, I think also um, with that is our book is pretty unique in the fact that it could really go in either way uh, because I would say about half of our book is very, traditionally memoir focused, but then that halfway point is literally called turning point where we turn into more of the teacher mode and it ends up being a lot of the nonfiction aspects. So we're able to target to like kind of both markets. Oh, but I nice. think our, why we've been so successful is as you mentioned is figure out what is your ideal avatar for your book and target them heavily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is exactly what we've done. Whereas us, we can hit on you know so many different markets where whether it's relationships, entrepreneurship, uh, mental health. I mean, so many different aspects. But we're not going to get to those as much right now. That may be a future thing. But right now, when we 
I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, really, when you launch a book, especially a memoir, because we're not a celebrity, it's essentially like putting lightning in a bottle. You have to ride with it and make that initial launch work. And so for us, we're like, okay, how do we push really hard from the beginning? And what are we going to focus on? And for us, it was the foster care community. And so um, this could really be, this could really work towards any community that, um, that you're in or that you're uh, that your book tailors towards, but for us, we're like, okay, what organizations, what initiatives, what um, contacts do we already have? And then we've noticed that conferences are our biggest sale. So uh, I know we just sold, actually, we're about to sell another 300 books for a conference. And what we did from the beginning, and I remember hearing this on uh, on a podcast review before, where you said maybe in the mid- beginning, you might have to do a few speaking engagements for free or ask them to buy your book instead. And so that's exactly what we did. Our first couple speaking engagements, we gave our book or we spoke for free. And that was a way for us to maybe sell some books instead of getting a speaking fee or just to get our foot in the door. And just by doing that for one month, we went from $0 for presentations the next month getting almost 500 for a presentation. I mean, and, and it's been going up drastically since then because we've been able to like raise those expectations from learning and that growth uh, and from, from that aspect. Mm-hmm. But figure out who your niche is and target them heavily, figure out where they are, what platforms they're on, and how can you communicate with change makers who are also in that community, who are willing to make those connections for you. Because we're, I can't remember who said this either, but it's like six degrees of separation. We're all separated from somebody that we want to talk to and just figuring out how to get there. Yeah, that's awesome. I love the focus on the avatar. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like maybe we were talking about this when we talk about it all the time. I feel like maybe it was Author Advantage Live last year. Yes, it which was. Which is, okay, the, the, the avatar now, um, and I think this might've been Pedro's session of like, who is talking to your avatar? And, yes. and so I love that you touched on, okay, now let, let's go find the organizations, conferences, book, book um, selling books. Can you unpack for folks, how did you land the first gig? or the, maybe the first couple, whichever would be most helpful or applicable to go through, um, mm-hmm. speaking gigs that sold bulk copies and just like X's and O's in the weeds. How did you get booked? Um, how did you add in like, hey, you're gonna you know, bulk purchase X amount of copies. And then how do you fulfill on that? Mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing is making sure that your speaking engagement aligns with your book. So you're talking about the topic of your book. You can't say, hey, I want to do a speaking engagement on this. And then your book is on a completely different topic. They have to overlap Mm. and kind of come together. And so for us, it really just started with saying we're authors and we're speakers. If people don't recognize you as that, they're not going to book you for that. So it's making it very visible, whether it's your LinkedIn heading, it's making a post on Facebook, hey, I'm open for presentations or constantly sharing what you've done. So it's, it's in the world, it's out there and people are coming to it. So it's really kind of those things together. Um, and so our first speaking engagement actually came from a friend that's, uh, that I'm friends with on Facebook. And they said, hey, it was actually about two weeks after we launched. And they said, hey, I had this conference and you guys fit right into the objective. What's your speaking fee? And we're like, speaking for you, we have no idea. (laughs) And so um, we said, we've learned, and this is for everybody listening, please listen. You ask, what is your budget? Do not tell them what you charge for your your first step. And what you ask is, what is your budget? Because I can tell you that for a conference that we're speaking at in a couple of weeks, I would have missed out on a couple grand if I didn't, if I would have told them what our speaking fee was versus them saying, this is our budget. And so you lean on that first. Um, and so that's what, that's what we did. We said, and she told us, uh, the friend, she said, we don't have a fee. Uh, we can't pay speaking fees, but we can buy, um, we can buy things for the audience. So we'll buy your book in lieu of your speaking fee. And I'm like, that's fine. What we did was we bought a thousand books from a local publisher I mean, from a local printer. And so that we saved a lot of money rather than going through Amazon or Ingram. And so we able we made like 70% of uh, what we spent on the mm. book. And so it actually worked wow. out great. That's amazing. So how did you, I mean, we're going to go super granular because I think people will really want to <laughs> know this. Uh, what was your cost per book? What did you sell it for? And why go with a local printer? Like what was the difference in, in, in printing costs? Yeah, great question. So with Amazon, I think it ended up being about $3 a book. Through Ingram, mm-hmm. it ended up being about $5 a book. And actually, no, Amazon, I think it was about $4 a book. And Ingram, it was like $7 a book with shipping. And with Ingram, mm-hmm. the problem is, is that you can buy books in bulk with Ingram, but I pay to ship it to me and then I pay to ship it to them. And so I'm hit yeah. twice versus yes. uh, we found a local printer 
and uh, we were actually able to pick out our paper that we wanted. I wanted recycle. I wanted a, a mm. I wanted a nicer cover than what than would come through Amazon or Ingram to make sure we're getting the color we want because that quality is important to me. And even after those, it only costs two dollars, like two twenty a book. And so we're able to sell them on our website for twenty dollars. So what we did initially was to get that Amazon ranking. Our first month and a half, uh, we we put all sales to, towards Amazon. So if somebody came to our our website, we weren't selling them by ourselves. We were telling them go to Amazon. So that was a way to boost up our Amazon sales. But then after about a month and a half, we said we took down that Amazon link off our website, and everybody was buying it through us. So that we're making. Um, so if a book costs two twenty a book, and then it costs three dollars to mail it through media mail that's way cheaper than if i if i buy the book through amazon or ingram pay shipping and then pay shipping again mm -hmm. that's great and and so and and next so you printed a uh through the local printer any tips or lessons you learned like what if i don't have a local printer how'd you find a local printer like what did that look like so I actually am really lucky that my mentor and pastor is also a, uh, she publishes books. And so she said, hey, Alexis, here's a local printer you could go to. But honestly, it was as, also as easy as going on Google and saying local printers near me. And you could even nice. price it out, cost it out. And I'm huge on getting quotes from people. I will call around till mm -hmm. the end of time to get quotes because yeah. I've learned even with things around our house, I'll call three different places and the price difference is astronomical. It's sometimes I get, <laughs> sometimes I get half of what yeah. the last one quoted. So I am always quoting. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. make sure you call around and, and get those quotes. Yeah, and to yeah. add to that, I mean, we, we make it a road trip. Like, so the, the local printer is kind of on the other side of the state. So it's about a two, two and a half hour drive. <laughs> we'll like, we'll rent a big van and we just picked up, I think about two or three weeks ago, we picked up a shipment of like 1500 books. So we'll rent a van because the, the shipping cost is about what? $600, $600. For shipping. Oh, and it wow. costs us $30 for the rental car. I'm like, I will <laughs> drive there. Yeah, so we, we rented a van, we rented a van and we went two hour drive to the other side of the other side of Michigan, picked up the books and picked up 1500 books. And that cut that, that helped us save like $600 on shipping. So yes. those are the that's small awesome. things you really got to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's a great tip. Um, so I was going to ask about that. Um, the decision to print 1500 books, um, what sparked that? And I think I heard shortly after is like, you'd already sold them out. So how did you sell those so quickly? Yeah, so it came into kind of what we talked about before, where we focused on uh, the conference aspect. And so when we got, we're already booked at probably seven conferences this year, and each one has bought books. So what you could do is, even though we're getting a speaking fee, we'll say, hey, would you also like books for your participants if we give them to you in bulk? And so that's a way for us to kind of do both or say, are you offering welcome packs? Would you like our book in there? Or trying to find, nice. you know, sustainable ways that we can get our books into other audiences. And also we're working towards getting our book into um, social work classes. So we're trying to think of sustainable long-term ways nice. that we can continue to make sales. And so we... Mm -hmm. Ordered a, th ordered a thousand books, got them on December 20th, I think. And we literally went straight to the post office with all the books in our car, mailed out 550. And then we <laughs> sold all of them like what, three weeks ago, probably yeah. two days before we picked up the next shipment, we sold out again. So this time wow. I'm like, okay, we're doing 1500 this time. And next time I'm sure it will go up. So it's kind of like, how much can we afford in this moment? Because yeah, yeah. we would have done probably three thousand, but we're like, we gotta think budget. We just bought our first yeah, house, so yeah. we gotta we gotta be realistic. <laughs> yeah, when it's cash flow versus margin, right? Exactly. And being mindful of both, and I think as a business owner, mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite quotes: "Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, cash is king." Uh, mm -hmm. And and you can be profitable but run out of cash. And if you're sitting on three thousand books, sure, you might make. 10 cents more per book. Yeah. <laughs> You've got no cash because it's all tied up. Exactly. And, and then and then the importance of starting with small batches so that you make sure if you don't sell them, you're not, I mean, we all know mm -hmm. someone who has like several hundred copies of their own book in their garage, right? And so, so you don't do that. And mm -hmm. and so thinking of both, which I think is super smart. What um You've mentioned avatar being super clear on your avatar. You've mentioned mm -hmm. partnerships with organizations. You've mentioned conferences and bulk purchases through there. Any other things that this worked well to sell books that you'd recommend, especially for other memoir authors? 
I mean, there we've really been able, to, with the help of SPS, really turn this redefining normal movement into a whole company, where you know we've been able to do like a podcast, been able to connect with other authors and give advice and so many other things. So we really try to just get the word out there as much as possible. And even I think my main priority is really social media and really trying to post every single day, but there is pieces and nuggets from the book, quotes, statistics, and other things like that. Taking that, putting that on social media, posting every single day to keep people updated on what's going on and continue the conversation ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I think that if people, especially those that do the SBS course, if you follow each of those steps, I mean, you are given the steps, but it's up to you to ultimately fulfill it. And I remember you said that on uh, on a podcast or it was a it was another show you did where it was basically your success is up to you. And don't, you know, negate how important it is to do that launch team. The launch team may be a small aspect of the course, but it is honestly, to me, the biggest aspect of it. Um, and we had 400 people on our launch team. And so we worked really hard on that. We followed every step that was possibly told by us in SBS, in the groups, in everything that we've learned. And we really leaned on them. And I think that was really difficult for us in the beginning because mm -hmm. as foster youth, you really learn to lean on yourself and figure everything out on your own. But mm -hmm. in being successful, we have to lean on other people. And I always mm -hmm. say we have to learn to be interdependent because that's what we're meant to be as humans. And ultimately, I believe what God intended for us to do. And so for us, we have to learn to lean on others. And so part of that is the launch team where it's saying, I trust you as my network to help me and support me through this. And for that, I'm going to give you a free book. Mm -hmm. So it's mutually yeah. beneficial where all yeah. relationships should be, but really take advantage of that. And then I think another huge aspect that authors don't pay attention to is the time that it takes to be, to be prepared for your launch. I think we get so excited to, we want to get this out there. We want to get it out to the world, but if you don't, get those steps in order and have your launch team and do everything that you need to do at least two, three months before the launch and get everything together. Because again, it's everything is before the launch. If you try to do all of this after the launch, it's almost too late. You have to do it all leading up. And I think that is just one of the biggest downfalls mm -hmm. that we've seen. Yeah, that's great. Hey, I, I'm going to go lightning round. Get a few minutes left. <laughs> all uh, right. So a few final questions. Um, <sighs> What was the most most helpful part of of the SPS process and SPS program for you guys? The coach. Yeah, I would say probably. The yeah, coach. I love Marcy. Marcy was incredible, and I actually cried on our first meeting um, because she's fostered. She's done all these incredible things. She's written a book on being a foster mom and all of this, and I was like, this is literally my person. And so mm. that to me yeah. was incredibly helpful. Mm, I was yeah. also the launch team as well. The launch team is pretty yeah. Good. yeah. Extremely Learning that because awesome. we we had our first book launch and it completely failed, and yeah. with the scholarship blueprint. And so we're like, we did something wrong. We need to know how to do it better. And so nice. that launch team piece was so important. That's great. And I think people uh, think it's just lip service when we say, "Hey, we're going to pair you up with a coach that's going to be really good for you," <laughs> <laughs> and based on you and based on your needs. So that, yes. that's really fun to hear. Like when someone has an amazing experience like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, a couple final questions. Knowing what you know now, uh, what would you be your advice? And I'd love to hear one from both of you. One piece of advice to the the other Justins out there, the other Alexis's out there, like knowing what you know now, what would be your advice to you from before you started this process? Yeah, I don't know if this is pretty like like generic advice, but be more willing to take risks. I mean, you know, we always think that, you know, things like this, the, the people who are trying to get you to, uh, to a, the next step with trying to help you write your book and help you do something in life. A lot of times we always think of something, oh, this is not a good thing. They're trying to take my money or whatever, whatever bad idea thing that we have in our mind, in the back of our head. But I would tell myself to be willing to more, take more risk and even calculate the risk. You know, be wise about the decisions you make, but just be willing and vulnerable to do what it takes and do what you need to do to get yourself to the next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, uh, we wanted to publish our book like two days after we got married. That would have been awful. And so we talked to somebody <laughs> who uh, went through a publisher and they said, um, you have to connect your story to something bigger. And so what we did was we postponed our launch till November, which was National Adoption Month. 
And so we were able to connect it to something big, bigger, which helped with the PR aspect, which is why we were able to get so many hits in the, in the PR world. And so that's one of the biggest things I would say for other people and that I'm incredibly thankful that I learned that because uh, this would have been awful mm -hmm. trying to launch right after a wedding. Yeah, that's super smart. I love, love that idea to connect into something bigger. And to your point, Justin, a mentor of mine said one time, he said, there's a difference between taking risks and being risky, right? Mm -hmm. So being risky is playing the lottery. Um, you know, taking a risk is you know, like for me, dropping out of school was a calculated risk, but mm -hmm. some people would view that as risky, but in my mind, it was a risk because you factor the downside and you factor the upside and you say, I'm going to take this risk. So mm. love both of those tips. Um, where can people go uh, to find out more about you, to buy your book or, or even to reach out to you about uh, having you speak uh, at their organization and both buying some books? Yeah, all of that's available on our website, re-definingnormal.com, or you can email us at re-definingnormal.com. Facebook is uh, Redefining Normal Memoir. Instagram is re.definingnormal. Um, so we're available for speaking engagements. We do any and everything. We've done keynotes, presentations, trainings, all of the above. Mm -hmm. And there's one piece of advice that Justin always gives that I think is incredibly important. Uh, um, and it basically goes, uh, there is somebody out there waiting to hear your story. And for you not giving your story and putting it out there and for taking that calculated risk, as you mentioned, somebody else is not getting what they need to move forward. And how many people have told us that they're not writing their book because of ours? That's that for, in everything mm. and all the struggles that it took to get through yeah. this, that is what, what made it worth it. Yeah. Leveraged impact. Let's go. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Exactly. Um, really cool to see. Hey, um, check out their stuff, guys. Go to read-definingnormal.com. Uh, also very excited. I think it's a great idea that you're doing this, the audio book. It sounds like coming out soon. So depending on when you're listening or watching uh, this, uh, maybe the audio book's out. So check it out uh, and maybe you'll enjoy that. If you'd like to chat with the team at Self-Publishing School about writing your own book, whether it's a memoir or, uh, or otherwise, go to self-publishingschool.com forward slash apply, book a call with the team. We'd be happy to chat with you about your book. And it's just been so cool seeing how you guys have inspired so many people, Justin and Alexis, and we're here rooting, rooting for you and helping, how, helping however we can. So thank you guys so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Of we course. appreciate you. Thank you so much. Take care.